And welcome back to this Dialogue Web Extra. I'm Marcia Franklin. We're talking about the wolf hunt season in Idaho, and we still have some calls holding from our televised program, so let's get to those. Carl in St. Mary's. Carl, go ahead, please. Yes, um, I would like a question for the fishing game officer is how much uh, revenue from hunters pays for the conservation efforts in the state of Idaho, number one, and number two, um, what are his plans for work after people stop buying the tags because the wolves have taken all the game? John, yeah. <laughs> some big questions there. Yes, I'm debating my response here. Um, well, first of all, I think the most important thing is, you know, we are committed to managing all wildlife, and that includes the deer and elk, and you know, we're taking these steps to manage all of these species in balance so that we can continue to have plentiful deer and elk populations and bear and lion and wolf populations into the future forever. And, and to his question about hunters supporting it, the bulk of, of your money comes from, from hunters. Yes, um, and our agency is uh, almost entirely funded by sportsmen with the revenue from license sales and then federal matching dollars uh, that come to us uh, that are generated from purchase of sporting equipment throughout do you the country. See, do you see a need for more broad-based support from the from the general population, not just hunters of fish and game? Definitely. Suzanne, you're shaking your head. Oh, I think that is the, one of the biggest factors affecting fish and game is that there's such a limited um, constituent base uh, in Idaho that they really only are paying attention to the hunters um, and then occasionally uh, as well the ranchers. But if we had recreationists in there, outdoor enthusiasts, people who are just general residents of the state, uh, outdoor educators, a much broader base of people supporting Idaho fishing games so that they weren't just representing the hunters but others as well. That would be great. Now, uh, okay, am I, I I'm sorry, we're, am I still live? Uh, can, I, can I still ask you a question, a follow-up? Well, we, we need to move along. I'm so sorry. Thank you, though, no. for calling. And we want to talk to Clayton in Coeur d'Alene. Clayton, go ahead, please. Why the Canadian gray wolf, and why does everybody think that uh, elk and deer population is going down because of our last two hard winters, and they're not blaming the wolves at all? Okay, so why yeah. the Canadian gray wolf was picked, is that what you're saying? Yep. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, there's really no doubt in the science that the wolf that was reintroduced into Idaho is the same wolf that was already here, moving Franklin. in yeah. naturally to Montana and Idaho and, and southern British Columbia. Uh, genetically, why, there's no difference. Let them move in. Then why I'm didn't here. we let them move in on their own and not put them in there? They actually had started to already. They were going into uh, northwestern Montana for several decades before the reintroduction of wolves into so Central Idaho. So his point is, why did, we, why did humans have to get involved? Well, I think it's because the scientists at the time were examining whether uh, a wolf population could be recovered here. And the best plan for recovery was to bring wolves back in three different areas. I'm here, Ms. Franklin. The uh, best plan was to okay, I'm gonna, more here and elk. Clayton, we're gonna, need, we're gonna need to move on. Mike Pop, you wanted to jump in on this? Well, I, I would say the, the wolf population exploded so much after the supposed reintroduction of the Canadian gray wolf out in northern Alberta. So we originally had that t uh, a different type of wolf here. So through all the glory years of high population of the ungulates, how come those wolves didn't explode? We had no hunting seasons. We had no depredation by wildlife services. We had no after-the-fact management. So if indeed, as Mr. Rochelle said, it was the same type of wolf, what happened between after the bounty hunting years through the high population of ungulate years into 1995 and the supposed reintroduction? Why didn't the wolves explode then? Did we get a bunch of um, studly wolves brought down here or what? Mr. Niemeyer. Well, I think, I think the explanation is very simple. The uh, wolves were pretty much exterminated by the 1930s, and wolves were moving down the Rocky Mountain chain for the next 60 years. Uh, you need two wolves but to breed. But this happened in five years. Well, the thing is, we, we did the reintroduction, and we got through the gauntlet. We brought 66 breeding wolves down, and they were able to breed. Over the last 60 years before that, yes, there were individual animals coming into Idaho and Montana following the Rocky Mountain chain, 
but they were unable to breed mostly because of mortality. Yeah. Thank you very they much for your call. They would have made the 60 wolf number in a matter of two or three years if, if, if 10 would have got here. We do have a question, uh, Mr. Michelle, from Dan, uh, one wondering if um, the Canadian gray wolves are going to threaten the uh, native wolves, which he says were timber wolves. Since the wolves are so territorial that they attack and kill coyotes, dogs, anything else that threatens their territory, are they going to kill timber wolves? No, I mean, this, this has been debated an awful lot over the years. Uh, yes, there were probably some wolves uh, here in Idaho at the time of the uh, reintroduction, but, uh, you know, genetically, uh, these are the same animals. Wolves are territorial. Uh, they will occasionally kill each other, but it has nothing to do with them being a different species. Can I just add, too, that, I mean, the Canadian border uh, is not something that is going to stop a wolf from crossing it. Um, they don't see the border as any type of boundary, just like other species don't. Canadian geese being an example. I mean, we have them here all over. But we've had wolves actually go from north of the area where we captured them in Canada, walk on their own into central Idaho, and turn around and walk back home within just a few ma a matter of a few months. Um, this, this myth about this somehow being a different type of wolf is, is pervasive, but it's not based on science and it's not based on reality. Okay, let's take a, a call from up your way, Mr. Pop. Dan and Kuski. Dan, go ahead, please. Yeah, there's a lot of us around the Clearwater area, uh, Dorshack area, that uh, a lot of elk and moose have been uh, annihilated by these uh, piranhas. This is what we're calling them down here, the wolves. They're like a pack of piranhas. What's your uh, say on that uh, uh, stereo on the, uh, the elk and moose population dwindling? Okay, up by Dorshack. Well, there's little doubt. Uh, I mean, wolves eat elk, wolves eat moose. Um, they're putting pressure on some of those populations. Uh, you know, from a management standpoint, from deer and elk, uh, you know, we uh, try to reduce our antlerless uh, elk harvest uh, when we're trying to regulate the population. Uh, but yes, these are areas where we've also focused for a more intensive uh, wolf harvest to help provide a little bit relief to those elk populations. Thank you very much for your call. And I'd like to put up a graphic if we can, just to briefly to show people where wolves have been taken in the last uh, month since the season has opened. And we can see here that um, a large quota was set in uh, Panhandle. It hasn't been met. Uh, and then again, in this low, low door shack area is 18, the low, low area is 27. So pretty high limits set there, although they're not being achieved so far. Certainly in the sawtooth is where people seem to be uh, finding and killing the wolves. It's uh, probably because the wolves there, or at least some of them, are going to be pretty habituated to seeing people. We saw the same thing over last weekend where the Yellowstone National Park, one of the pack members or packs from the park crossed out of the boundary and w was the entire pack, um, at least the adult members, were all killed and apparently some of the pups as well. Because they're so habituated, yeah, Franklin. Because they're so habituated to seeing people, it makes it a lot easier for people to kill them. Mr. Pop. It it, well, I don't, it's not easy to harvest a wolf, but it's interesting to have uh, Mr. Niemeyer here because we can ask him the percentage of kills using our methods, the method that the uh, t legal tag buyer uses right now. Um, what, what, how many of those techniques, how many of the wolves that Wildlife Services have killed within the last 14 years has actually been by the methods that we're allowed to use now? Probably a very small number, because uh, wildlife services yeah. very often depends on aviation to accomplish the removal of problem Right, holes. and trapping, and trapping. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of have our hands tied here, and to be used as a management tool with your hands tied for a low-balled quota number that we can't even meet, boy, it sure looks us, makes us look pretty funny when we're not going to meet this quota, but you have to understand that this is North America's largest pack predator, and he's a product of evolution. And with over 50,000 in Canada and Alaska and being able to be shot from the air and trapped, and they still can't keep a handle on that, with our restrictions here, and as Mr. Niemeyer just confirmed, our methods of take will not work uh, incidental hunting uh, per se does not work on a large predator for uh, population management. Do you see um, 
that there might be trapping or aerial hunting in Idaho's future uh, for wolves? I don't think it's likely that we'll be considering aerial hunting any time in the near future, but uh, yes, trapping uh, is uh, a realistic outcome. But, you know, there's tremendous value into stepping forward this first season with a relatively conservative approach uh, to learn from the experience this first year. You know, if we had come in with uh, some sort of uh, a much higher radical uh, harvest limits, uh, you know, in all likelihood, uh, we never would have got the first day of the hunt behind us because it would have been stopped in court. And just but it depends on how you look at the numbers. Ms. Your 220 harvest limit is over the number of wolves that we're even supposed to have in the state, which was a little over 100. And now you're willing to bargain at 550, I heard you say, between 550 and 700, excuse me. Uh, that, I mean, again, that points back to the confusion I think people have that somehow we were supposed to get to 150 wolves or 100 wolves and stop. And that was not the point of restoring wolves to the state. We were supposed to have a, a connected metapopulation of wolves here, which scientists, um, you know, turning over management of the wolves from the federal government to the state agencies did not mean you start reducing the numbers of wolves at that point. You're turning over the conservation of the species at that point. We have uh, somewhere around 800 or so adult wolves in the state right now, uh, or, or had before the hunt started, uh, based on last year's annual report. We have uh, somewhere between three and 4,000 mountain lions in the state that eat twice as much elk as what wolves do. Um, so we know we can live with animals at healthier population numbers. There is absolutely no justification for, for dropping the wolf population down so radically, but politically you can see where the pressure is coming from and that people expect that somehow we're going to get down to those lower numbers. Even at the Idaho Fish and Game Commission meeting in August, they said if the hunters didn't kill their full quota or if they wanted to go for more wolves, which they would examine later, that their ultimate goal was to bring the population down to 518 and that they would use other tools in the toolbox, including aerial gunning, trapping, whatever it took to reduce the wolf numbers down. So, it, it, you know, it's Will that occur, Mr. Rochelle, if the hunters don't meet their quota, will Fish and Game um, take action? Yes, I think there's little doubt that they're going to consider adjustments. Uh, uh, with the plan being over the next several of years to getting down towards 500 wolves in the state. It's, it's very difficult. They're trying to achieve a balance between what they're hearing on this very, very polarized issue where there are many people in the state that would like to see zero wolves and there were some that would like to see wolves everywhere. And they're trying to find that balance on how we can manage wolves long term. Okay, let's, let's hear from mm -hmm. Scott in Middleton. Scott, go ahead, please. I yeah, my question is um, about the uh, legal action that's being taken. Um, our Department of Fish and Game, um, as well as the governor, as he mentioned, has an acceptable number that's well over the minimum standard. And the Department of Fish and Game has done well in managing uh, other protected species, salmon and steelhead, and, and varied the seasons each year depending on the returns. And so I'm wondering, is the legal action to prevent the hunts, or is it to establish a acceptable level of wolves, an acceptable number? Thank you. Can you clarify again sure. what the uh, standing lawsuit? Is? Well, unfortunately, what the governor and Fish and Game had proposed are not binding uh, legally, uh, and the only binding document we have in the state is the Idaho State Legislative Wolf Management Plan. So that was the plan that that allows uh, out of our population about a thousand wolves altogether right now. Uh, only to have 150 wolves in the state, so the, the state can actually eliminate legally that many wolves. Our concern is that that's going to be too few if, if the state legislature follows through um, and this becomes a political management of the species rather than a wildlife management issue, uh, which we've seen certainly happen in the past. Uh, Idaho has a long so history. The, the lawsuit is not to stop the hunt. The lawsuit is to right. change the terms of the delisting. We believe the hunt's illegal right now because the delisting rule, the federal delisting rule itself, is illegal. And I think uh, it, the uh, judge made that very clear that he felt that we were likely to succeed on the merits of our case because he also thought that uh, the uh, delisting rule was illegal. Thank you for your call. Where do you see this headed? Uh, do you, you can't predict what judges can do, but um, as she said, the judge has made some comments so far on this issue. I don't really know the outcome. I, I'm uh, sensing the Wyoming 
issue is the, you know, the loose thread that's got to be dealt with yet. And Montana set a much lower quota. Um, was that more acceptable to you, Suzanne? Look, again, it's really not about the quota. Mm. It's, a, it's about uh, less about the numbers than anything. Mm. Um, it's more about how this population functions as, as one connected, uh, interconnected metapopulation of and wolves. And not having Wyoming, not having a plan is of cons great concern to you. Well, Wyoming does have a plan, okay. but it was rejected by the federal courts. Um, and, and there's certainly um, concern about whether Wyoming would even step up to the plate um, later. But even with the Wyoming plan, if, they, if they're only guaranteeing 15 breeding pairs of wolves like Idaho has done, um, <coughs> it's going to be too few to be sustained over the long term. And that's, that's the concern. Why restore wolves if you don't have a healthy population of wolves going forward into the future? Um, you know, there's just, this becomes more of a political um, debate than, than a wildlife management issue. Okay, we've got one more call, Lainey in Sandpoint. Lainey, thanks for holding. Go ahead, please. Thank you for taking my call. On this question about the population, a healthy population, Michael Soule, who is the Dean of Conservation Biology, has stated that in order to be biologically recovered, any animal population needs to number in the thousands, not hundreds. So this question I would like to direct to Mr. Rochelle. In light of that uh, scientist's statement, how can Idaho Fish and Game justify their goal of reducing Idaho's wolf population down to 500 wolves to 518? Yes, I'm, I'm quite familiar with Dr. Soleil's work, uh, and I think it's the context that you need to look at when you're talking about population viability long term in an isolated situation like on an island where there's no ingress or egress uh, you need to have much larger numbers but I don't see this as Idaho having 500 wolves I see this as we've got a minimum of 500 wolves in Idaho we have 500 wolves in Montana 500 wolves in Wyoming and we've got 50 to 60,000 wolves in Canada and they're all interconnected uh, I mean wolves travel fantastic distances uh, and so we've got that genetic interchange that provides that crux uh, and that very necessary component to long-term population viability. You're saying that thousands of wolves are going to come down from Canada? No, you've got this interchange and that's the concern with the viability. I mean right now with 1600 wolves uh, here in the northern Rockies they're not isolated. Uh, you've got great variability. You've got great mobility. Uh, you know, I think if you look at Soule's work very carefully, you'll see that you're you're really looking uh, at a much larger metapopulation than uh, what we're just what we have in Idaho alone. Unless we get to the point where we're building impassable brick walls or other obstacles to uh, wolf movements, uh, that doesn't really apply that way. Let, let's supply though. If there's 1,600 wolves out there right now, and you say that's going to be guaranteed over the long term, let's put it in paper. Let's put it as a legally binding thing that we're going to have 1,600 wolves into the future here in the region. Right now, that doesn't exist. The only legally binding document we have right now says there's going to be 450 wolves between the three states, period. Um, yeah, no more right. than that are guaranteed. And this thing about connectivity, we know that when we had less than 200 wolves per state in the region, uh, in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, that those populations were not connected as a metapopulation, as Dr. Soule had, has recommended among other scientists. Thank you so much for your call, Lainey. Yeah, as, I'm as here. We, as <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I know. As we wrap up, I do want to talk to the two hunters. So he, well, you hunt as well, I'm sure. And, and Carter, um, will you be, do you have a wolf tag? Are you planning to hunt a wolf? I purchased a wolf tag. Uh, I have no intentions of using it. Do you think that this is, uh, uh, that wolves have decimated the elk population, or do you think it has uh, changed the way hunters need to approach hunting? I do not believe that elk herds have been decimated, and uh, I think absolutely wolves have had an impact on uh, elk behavior, and, and I think hunters are just going to have to hunt smarter, and there's still a possibility of a uh, good harvest of big game in Idaho, Montana, Wyoming. And Mr. Pop, will you be um, looking for a wolf? Uh, you have a wolf tag, yes? 
You bet. And and I think um, the numbers prove that the all ungulates that right now the problem is the underlying problem is there's no voice here for our ungulates and it's great this that the whole dialogue's been about the wolves but you have to understand the wolves have to eat and again the numbers say not only about the decimated ungulate herds but as we speak there is a wolf pack in idaho killing something right now and it shouldn't be that way we can see varied opinions on this issue and that will continue. This is one of many programs that we've done on the wolf issue in Idaho and we'll continue to cover that. I want to thank my guests for not only being on the broadcast portion of the program but also staying to answer the phone calls and emails on this Dialogue Web Extra. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Marcia Franklin and join us again on Dialogue.